What up, fam? I'm Dr. Day Luna, and you are listening to Drop It Like It's Doc podcast. Today, we have on Dr. Sarah, a phenomenal naturopathic doctor here in San Diego. Today, we're talking all about the body, self-love, body dysmorphia, disordered eating, and ultimately, we're giving you the tools to fall back in love with your body, to feel confident, and in turn, this is gonna help your hormones, your blood sugar, your sleep, your relationships, everything. So this is a conversation that if you're working on self-love, you're going to want to listen to absolutely tune in with a girlfriend that needs to hear it. And I am so excited for you to learn along. Hi, Dr. Sarah. Hi, Ashley. What an honor to be sitting across this room from you. Oh my gosh, you're going to make me cry. <laughs> Good. No, I'm going to cry in about one second. So okay. we can start crying at any point. And the reason that I'm going to cry is because, as you know, I always start this podcast with a love bomb. And Sarah, here we go. I already feel my throat closing because I'm going to cry. I really would not be where I am in my life without you. I know I wouldn't. We became best friends during such a special time of life. It wasn't even in med school, it was after. And it was in such a transitionary phase of my life in which I thought I was leaving this country. I thought I was moving. And then you were already such a badass babe, like setting up your practice, so confident in your skills, checking off boxes, and you really paved the way for me to have confidence to even open up my own medical practice. You helped me learn how to do all the ins and outs of the business stuff, and you did it with such an open heart. You helped to inspire me to follow my dreams in a way that no friend honestly has before. You helped to support me emotionally, and just as not only someone in the same business, but someone just in my life. And I think that you helped me to unravel a lot of patterns in which women are competitive, women are mean, women don't want one another to succeed because you were always so open to share. And not only that, you were always so open to listen. You held so much space for me during my divorce, during my stalker phase, during just a really, 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 really challenging part of my life. And I kid you not, I don't know if I would even have a podcast without you and just reminding me that, you know, my dreams matter and that anything is possible. And just you as a whole, like you are a badass babe. Like I, you inspire me endlessly with the way that you show up to the world. And I have no doubt in my mind that we are going to be, you know, looking back at this chapter of our lives in the next like 10, 15 years being like, wow, we did it. We made it all happen. And again, I would not be where I am in my life without you. And there's no words that can even express the gratitude that I have for you. And I can't believe that I didn't just sob that whole time, but like, I feel it in my throat. And just thank you for being you, Dr. Aww. Sarah, Sarah, all the things. Ugh, I love your child, Cyrus. <laughs> I love him He's so much. Dog, He's a dog. <laughs> He's a dog. And I love him so much. I could keep on going. I could keep on going. I love your style. I love your smile. Oh I my love, gosh. I just love how mindful you are and just the things that you say and the, the perspective that you have. And also you're so down to earth, but you're also so open to the spiritual side of things. You help me to connect with my angels. You help me to connect with my intuition. You help me to just find joy in my life when I really was in a black hole of darkness. And again, no words can even come close to express how much love you've given me. So thank you for who you are. Oh, Ashley, that was so sweet. I'm like love struck. Good. <laughs> um, but yeah, going back to what you were saying about supporting you through those times, I mean, you just have such a bright light and holding a mirror for you to see all that you have to offer this world was easy. It was effortless. It was like, duh. Like. <laughs> It took minimal effort mm -hmm. and um, I'm just so proud of you. You have made leaps and bounds emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, physically, and to see you here. Yeah, it's going to be mind blowing to see where we are in 10, 15 years. Yes. So thank you for having me. Thank you for love bombing me. I just, I'm going to listen to that every day in the morning yes. affirmation station. 
listen to it, receive it, and there will be more coming, I'm sure, throughout this podcast. And I am so excited to have this conversation. We'll see where it takes us. But for those of you that don't know, Dr. Sarah, she is also a naturopathic doctor. You specialize in women's hormones. You specialize in all sorts of things that we're going to get into today. So before we do, I would love to just chat a little bit about your journey to naturopathic medicine because Mm -hmm. everyone has a story and I would love to hear a little bit about yours. Yeah. So I grew up in New Jersey, East Coast gals. (laughs) And originally I was in school to be a high school science teacher. I just loved children. I loved teaching them things and throughout that education at Rutgers I was doing my student teaching and recognizing how much of a role the government had on teachers and what they could say in the classroom and I was like oh shoot I don't know if this is the career for me and I was a yoga teacher at the time teaching yoga classes and my students would ask questions like "Um, what should I do for my lower back pain or do you know what poses I should do for menstrual cramps or um, what should I do for anxiety? And then one day I had a student come in and say, Sarah, since I've taken your classes, I've come off of my antidepressants. And I'm like, oh, amazing. And also, oh shit, like I'm not trained to support anyone in this, even though you did it by yourself without telling me. And I went <laughs> home that night and I'll never forget this night. And I Googled doctors that help people come off medication. Wow. And then I found naturopathic medicine and I saw that there was a school in San Diego, which my heart was always pulling me to, that offered this education and I was like, a soul hell yes this is my path this is what i'm doing so that brings us out into 2014 i started school um and i always thought i wanted to work with pediatrics that didn't end up happening because working with parents of kiddos can be a little tough yes (laughs) so i work with the moms instead but when i started my medical practice in october of 2020 i was Somehow I was naturally pulling in a lot of women with disordered eating Mm. and um, body image concerns, orthorexia, anorexia, bulimia, and spent about nine months to a year supporting primarily just mental health in the realm of how women are viewing themselves. And after we healed, I say we, because a collective, we were all healing during this time. After these patients were healing their body dysmorphia and body image concerns, we then had to unravel what did that do to their physiology and their Mm -hmm. hormones while they were living in that mental health state. Um, So I kind of went through a year working with women through body dysmorphia, body image, eating disorders, and that transitioned my practice primarily now to hormone health. So PCOS, infertility, postpartum care, endometriosis, all that jazz. And that's definitely where my passion lies is helping women love themselves so that they can show up for themselves and respect themselves to make their healing easier. Mm -hmm. I love that. (laughs) And you do do so well at that. Even your eyes, they're just so loving. And I can imagine that your patients just feel so held by you in whatever phase of that journey that they're on. Because Mm -hmm. with anything that you bring up to anyone, I mean, I'm sure this happens to you a lot that it's maybe the first time that these patients have ever told someone their habits around eating or the way that they view themselves or the way that they talk to themselves and you create such a safe space to do that. So I just Mm -hmm. wanted to reflect that back to you as well. And just quick question about your past because your parents own a pharmacy. Yeah. So oh, how ironic that, I that, that That's you're like, like a big how do you story. help people come off of medication? Yeah. yeah. Both of my parents are pharmacists and own independent pharmacies back on the East Coast. And I also remember being really young and patients would come. I mean, to get their prescriptions and my mom would be like, oh, that's the regular Joe so-and-so here to get X, Y, and Z. And back then, even in my head as like a sixth and seventh grader, I would think, why are there regulars here? Mm-hmm. Why are there people relying on these medications? There has to be a way to help them outside of that. So yeah, um, but my parents are, they love what I do. They're so proud of what I do. My mom actually studied homeopathy for a couple of years. And when patients come in to get prescriptions, she'll staple on their prescription bag, nutrients that are depleted by that medication and and things to consider when you're on it. So she's, yeah, she's a trailblazer out there. That's amazing. That's unheard of, especially on the East coast, just Uh being another East coaster. That is truly unheard of. So, Mm -hmm. wow. I love that. Your family is so loving and supportive. I, I remember your family just having that graduation party and just being in your bubble. I was like, wow, this makes sense why Sarah is the way that she is because Um, you had such a gorgeous, loving family. The love that your family emits is unbelievable. Yeah. It's really special. Mm -hmm. Hence me flying back there like every three months to spend time with them. (laughs) Hi, coastal babes making it happen. (laughs) 
<laughs> yes. So in your journey in supporting women through this kind of emotional eating or disordered eating and whatnot mm-hmm. into the hormone thing, as far as, you know, of course that throws off your hormones and whatnot, but I would love to start with the disordered eating part because it's something that I haven't spoken about much on my podcast. Yeah. And it's something that is a part of my history, my family history. My aunt had severe anorexia to the point that she, I mean, for those of you that are viewing this, I don't know if you can tell how small I am. I'm about five, two. I'm, I'm a petite person. And I remember being in sixth grade and my aunt, I went to visit her and I was trying on her clothes and her clothes didn't fit me. And it's because they were too small. Her pants were double zeros and oh they did not gosh. fit me. And she would say things to me like, I'm so fat. Uh, you have such a beautiful body. And she would be looking at herself in the mirror. And I just remember being in sixth grade so confused because here's this woman who I admired, who I looked up to, who I thought was one of the most beautiful people in the world, who I wanted to be like, I wanted to dress like her. I wanted to show up in the world like her, but I couldn't fit in her clothes. She was telling me I was beautiful, but there was such a deep disconnect to how she was and how she saw herself in the mirror. Mm -hmm. So it's something that whether I'm aware of it or not, which I am aware of it, those did drip into my subconscious. And it showed up in high school with, you know, one of my best friends telling me, hey, you're gaining a little bit of weight here. Like, how about we do some crunches after dinner? Things like that. And I don't know where I'm going with this little blurb, but I'll share more about my past after. But what are some things that you've seen in in this arm of medicine. For sure. I think with my demographic specifically, we see so much orthorexia, which is the obsession of being healthy. And individuals are learning what health is from outlets that aren't safe or what they should be doing. So I see a lot of orthorexia and how that can present is intermittent fasting, being vegan, not getting enough food in throughout the day, um, obsessing over staying away from carbs, even though like our brain needs that or staying away from fats because they have so much nutrient density, they're afraid of calories. So that is one way that I'm seeing it presented. Um, I don't see as much in my practice like I used to anorexia and bulimia because I think there has been a lot of conversations about this sort of, not saying that they're not present, but mm-hmm. um, mainly people who are coming to me who haven't been diagnosed yet or figured out what their mindset is around food. It's from the, the realm of orthorexia or in the realm of body dysmorphia, which is when you have an obsession over a specific part of your body. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be weight. It could be like, I don't like my nose. I hate my hair. I don't like that. I have a pimple every now and then my biceps suck. It's usually just obsessing over a certain thing. So I see it with orthorexia the most and with body dysmorphia as well. Mm -hmm. And just as a woman in this world, I see a lot of those too. I see it in my life, in my patients' lives, in my friends' lives. And I think for me, when I first moved to California, I, and I moved here when I was 17 and I had a body, you know, when you're 17, your body's still changing. It's immensely. changing through like 27. Yeah. Like there's this second puberty between like 23 and 25. No one talks about. Yeah. So, yeah. But 17, yes. especially as well. You know, and I'm happy to hear you say that because a lot of women that I do work with, they are so attached to their body that they had in high school. <laughs> Huh? And our body, like think about high school, we're fucking fetuses. Yeah. Like our bodies are not supposed to look that way. No. That is not what a healthy body will look like throughout your life. And I work with a lot of individuals that are so attached to that, that they're kind of always trying to fit into their high school pants or always and trying to, you know, have that high school body or whatever it is. And that is not in alignment with reality because our body will change and shift. And as women, you know, we enter we're fertile and mm-hmm. our body will shift based on that fertility. And when we are always forcing our body to be smaller, to be less than, to move in a way that isn't in alignment with health, then that makes our body not feel safe to do really anything. Mm-hmm. And my mind just went to so many different directions that we're going to take this on. <laughs> I love it. Um, I love it too. But yeah. it's, it's, it's honestly really a shame that women aren't taught this information that your body Mm -hmm. is going to change and that change is in alignment with your health. And also it's a beautiful thing. It's a gorgeous thing. Yeah. Yeah. I saw a really cute interview a couple weeks ago. I reshared it on my Instagram of an interviewer asking a bunch of kids, Hmm. if you could change anything about your body, what would you like to change? And, you know, as an adult, we go to like, oh, I wish that my stomach was more muscular or I wish that my arms were skinnier. But these kids were like, I wish I had wings so I could fly or I wish I was (laughs) as fast as a cheetah or I wish I had, you know, they were naming 
parts to add to themselves mm. and not take away. And I was just like, oh my gosh, the innocence here. And it got me thinking at what point is that script flipped to recognizing that we're thinking something is wrong with us as opposed to being inherently amazing and beautiful and capable and wonderful. And how do we get our culture back to understanding it's not about how you look and it's more about how you feel. Mm -hmm. And I tell my patients all the time, I would rather you have beautiful, flowing, flexible thoughts about your body more than you having a beautiful, flowing, flexible body. Cause mm -hmm. that's always going to change. Yes. And if your mindset stays stable and strong, that's what we're going to try and latch on to. Mm -hmm. And for you, where do you think that disconnect happens? Because I can very much picture yeah. where it happened in my life and I'll share that too, but I'm curious for you. Yeah. I, what I think the most is when boys and girls are going through puberty together and girls are getting curvier hips, girls are getting their breasts in and boys are getting more muscu muscular and slimming down and just watching your, your community just kind of like go those separate ways. Mm -hmm. And the boys get applauded. Like you're so much stronger, you're so much faster, so much this, so much that. Whereas us women were, yeah, we're scrutinized. And then there's, there's magazines and social media and your friends. And yeah. So I'm going to say like fourth, fifth and sixth grade, but it could even happen earlier yeah. now, like yeah. first and second grade. I just giggled in my head because I was thinking back to just middle school, like how <laughs> me and all my friends, we, we started changing, you know, and, and like yeah. these little boys, they're just like little puny little boys. And it's just, it's, it is, it's such a shift, but I, I, I've never honestly thought of that before. And mm -hmm. that, that doesn't make a lot of sense. I know for me, it happened when I was a dancer mm. and I, I was a dancer since I was little. And you know, when you're a dancer, you're in a leotard and tights, you're essentially naked. And I remember people would always come up to me and I straight up was very nutrient depleted for most of my life. It's actually a miracle that I have a brain that is able to have thoughts that I can communicate to the masses. And that because, is so smart. You are like yeah. the smartest human I know. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, <laughs> I don't know, but no, truly I did not eat much growing up and it's because me and food, I just didn't feel connected to. It wasn't disordered at that point. I don't think I just didn't like food. I don't know. Very strange. But then when I was a dancer in my little body, people would always come up to me and be like, oh, you have the perfect body for dance. Like, oh, don't gosh. change. It's perfect. And then I would see these older students, women again, that I looked up to, that I admired, these gorgeous women and they would be scrutinizing themselves in the mirror and they would be talking about how, and there's a lot of disordered eating mm -hmm. and dancing. I think that everyone knows that, but they would talk about how they made themselves vomit. They would talk about how they restricted their eating. They would even do it together, you know? Yeah. And, and I remember just being so confused because these were women that I thought were my role models. So then I thought, oh, am I supposed to feel this way about myself? So it really is something that can be modeled. And I love that truly you are someone that models loving your body as it is. Mm -hmm. You are someone that models, you know, that the number on a scale doesn't matter mm -mm. at all. Mm -mm. And it doesn't. It no. really doesn't matter. I always like to educate my patients. I'm like, your weight is going to fluctuate dramatically, even yeah. throughout the day. You can't yeah. be attached to that number. It no. doesn't make any sense to be attached to that number. It doesn't at all. What you were sharing reminds me of a story. I was leaving a yoga class one day and a man came up to me and he was like, you have a beautiful body. Don't let anyone tell you that you should lose weight. And I was like, this was really five years ago. And I was like, he's saying this because he thinks other people are probably telling me to lose weight. And then I got all in my head about it mm -hmm. thinking WTF. Yeah. <laughs> Do I need to lose weight? Why is he applauding me for being in a stronger, bigger frame? But yeah, the scale doesn't matter. I mean, you could, it's, I mean, we know this as scientists that muscle weighs more than fat. So you could be 180 pounds and be in a size four pants but you could also be 120 pounds and be in like a size 18 clothes. So mm -hmm. yeah, we, we don't, I don't allow ever my patients to talk about weight loss. Mm -hmm. I'm open to talking about muscle building and fat loss, but yeah, weight loss isn't a thing that I treat or support. That brings me immense joy. Yeah. Yes. Because you're even changing that script in initially when someone's coming in mm -hmm. and it's always in alignment with health then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also just, I feel the need to share this with the listeners. Please don't ever say anything to anyone about their body. It's not your place to do that. And it's immensely traumatic and it will sit in the subconscious and they'll think about it every day. So it could be as simple as asking someone like, what's going on with your skin? Or are you okay? It looks like you lost weight. I remember that happened to me after COVID. Yeah. I, I, you 
I could not eat for a week and I am small and I lost so much weight and I was so embarrassed to go in public. I was embarrassed to teach yoga because I didn't look healthy. Mm -hmm. And people would say something to me like, oh, what have you been doing? You yeah. lost weight. I'm like, mm. yeah. Yeah, after my like deepest depression going through a breakup, people would compliment me because I lost weight. Of course, I wasn't eating. Being like, you look so amazing. You look so good. And yeah. To whose standard? <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> I'm so happy that you think I look good. Yeah. Yes. So let's chat a little bit more about orthorexia because that's definitely something that both of us see a lot in our mm -hmm. practice and just in our world and living in Southern California, you know, and also just in the age of social media where people can learn things online about what is healthy and what's not. I find that it's really easy for people to kind of slip into that world without recognizing that they're slipping into that world. And I actually remember something that you posted on social media that was like, I replaced, you know, gluten-free this with that. And I replaced like low fat this with full fat that. And it's, it's inspiring because people need to see it happen and they need to realize that you don't need to be scared of yeah. food. But that's with me saying as someone who, you know, shares openly about the toxins in our food and the dangers as far as that goes. But I want to remind everyone listening that you can have and I forget who says this. One of my patients actually said this to me and I think he got it from a different doctor. So this is you listening. Thank you. <laughs> but you can, it's better to have a happy donut than a sad salad. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's all just based on what you are telling your body when you are ingesting that food. Yeah. And what do you see a lot of orthorexia wise in your practice? Like clinical manifestations, mm -hmm. what it's causing. Or just anything that you want to share okay. about orthorexia. Really. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, I'm seeing that due to beauty standards and um, yeah, like looking at social media, looking at magazines, looking at actors and actresses and seeing that people are in these perfect bodies that are probably edited to look that perfect, mm -hmm. it leads us into that automatic comparison mindset of, oh, I should be doing this or I should be doing that. And then it causes women, I think a lot of women our age to want to show up for the day and think of how they can restrict. Mm -hmm. How do I restrict, restrict my food intake or over exercising or being smaller and trying to fit themselves in places they probably shouldn't be, or that's going unnatural to their development or what, what um, and while they're doing that, they are putting their body under severe distress. Mm -hmm. And one of the first things to go when your body's under distress is your female hormones, because your hormones are like, this is not a safe body to bring a baby into. And even if you're not wanting to get pregnant, um, your hormones are going to shut down. Essentially your progesterone and estrogen are going to say danger, danger, danger. And then you're going to deal with really bad PMS, maybe irregular menstrual cycles then probably anxiety and depression. So I'm seeing it first present as someone's waking up every single day, wishing that they looked different. And due to that, uh, brain thought, the brain wave that's happening, they're then taking actions throughout the day, even small actions that are causing every cell in their body to respond negatively. So to get to the root cause of all these hormone concerns or mental health concerns, we have to start with how are you viewing yourself? How are you thinking about yourself and heal that first? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you touch upon a lot of really good things. And I think that for some people, orthorexia can absolutely be rooted in this disordered pattern of viewing themselves of the restriction piece. Mm -hmm. For me, when I was orthorexic, I think that it wasn't necessarily for me that I was trying to restrict or lose because, you know, I'm yeah, of course I've had my own struggles with my body, but like, I, I honestly really love her and I think she looks great. And, um, it was never for that. It yeah. was more so that I was so fearful yeah, of scared. what I was scared of the food. I was scared yeah. of what the government did to our food. I was scared of just even what I would be supporting with my money if I paid for certain things mm. food wise. So I became overly obsessed with food quality where it was coming from. But then that spilled over into my ability to socialize, my ability to go to parties, my ability to eat out with my friends, my ability to be with my family. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't healthy. So then that fully isolated me in which then I would eat fully by myself on holidays and things that honestly could make me cry. Thinking back to like mm. Christmases that I fully would not participate in anything with the family. And I felt fully alone and that was all on me. But 
for listeners, you know, you might be fully comfortable with your body. You might've gone a really long way in working on that, but still your obsession over what you're eating, how you're eating, the timing of eating, where you're getting it from is still causing that same stress pattern for sure. that could then throw off all of your hormones. And I love that not only that you brought up that these hormonal issues are causing menstrual disturbances and changes, whether you're still getting your period and getting PMS or, you know, if you're skipping periods at all, but then that's going to flow into mental health because yeah. All of those female hormones, you know, they make us feel good. I mean, I I love progesterone. Yeah. Love estrogen imbalance as well. Yeah. 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 I'm glad you brought that up because it's not just the um, scarcity mindset around your body, but also the fear of what am I exposing myself to? How can I be the best version of myself, so, so to speak, in a healthy way so that I'm a better mom, better partner, better at my career, but that obsession, like you're saying, can take you into some severe isolation mm -hmm. or be just being neurotic and like going to a restaurant and saying, I can't have garlic because I'm a little sensitive and it makes me bloat sometimes. Like, yes. Yeah. That was me. Was I it? did a food allergy test. No, truly. I oh, did a Cyrex food, food allergy test. test. Yeah. I don't even have autoimmunity. Like, I don't know why I did it. I just want to know because my gut was a mess because I was vegan Yeah. and only eating like raw vegetables. No. And I'm like, why am I bloated all the time? This was when I was still in med school and didn't have that understanding. So I did a food allergy test. So many things came up. I actually haven't talked about this on this podcast yet. So I'm happy. So many foods came up because I leaky gut, probably from stress. Also, so probably because our med school was riddled with mold and a whole mm -hmm. bunch of other stuff. So, so many food sensitivities came up on that test. So for me, it made me insane. I would say about what I could eat, how I would eat additives in this and that. So that is definitely something that could come up. And I'm really grateful that you yeah. shared that. Yeah. Anytime a patient uh, has an intro call with me and they're like, I want to do food sensitivity. I'm like, well, pull the brakes. We're, yeah. we're not starting there. We can't start there. <laughs> I'm, I'm not feeding into this. No, no, no. <laughs> and even something that you said about, you know, the mom piece and, you know, wanting to show up for your family and wanting to, you know, however that obsessive thoughts are coming in. I think it's really important that as women and, you know, we will be parents one day. I know that we will. I have no doubt that our daughters will be best friends, but yeah, they will. we need to really realize how our actions are then imprinting on our young whether oh, yeah. and i can even think back to my mom who is my size gorgeous hottie mindy being in the express dressing room her trying on size five pants and crying mm. just sobbing and me being like hmm? why what's wrong um so apparently this is just story time for me today <laughs> which is great don't have no problem sharing any part of my past but it's really important as moms. It is, it is. Yeah. I was trying on bridesmaids dresses for my brother's wedding last year. And I was calling my mom and I was like, oh, I'm just gonna go up a size. I think it'll fit better. And she was like, it's never fun to go up in a size. <laughs> I thought it was fine. I was like, cool. I can move my body more yeah, and dance I'll be able to get better. down on the dance floor. And I was just like, shoot, like, it just breaks my heart that these women have been on this earth for so long, not even just their moms, but everyone in, I think, in their age group and mm -hmm. go to their grave having these thoughts about their body that aren't nice all the time. No. And our sweet cells hear everything that our mind says. So if your mind says, I am this or that or, and essentially it's saying that I am not worthy of nourishing myself. Right. And wow do your cells respond to that they shut on down so with that being said mm -hmm. let's transition into some of the kind of physiological things that you see show up in your practice when disordered eating is a piece yeah yeah so um when there's malnutrition and i do diagnose a lot of my patients as malnourished and even if it's unintentional because mm -hmm. they're just busy girl bossing and they're not getting enough food in one of the first things that we'll see is cortisol imbalances. So either cortisol being really, really high or then dropping off and plummeting and being really, really low. Um, we will most definitely see lack of progesterone or non-existent progesterone, which then manifests as a lot of hormone concerns like I spoke about before with either infertility or with irregular cycles or really bad PMS or PMDD. Um, we'll also see potentially very high estrogen because sometimes the food that they're getting in is not 
nutrient dense whole foods, high quality. So let me just have this quick protein bar here that's filled with fake soy isolates and that is, yeah, causing estrogen levels to skyrocket. So we'll see really painful periods, fibrocystic breast, endometriosis, all of those other concerns come about. Um, and then of course, the biggest thing that I see change when I tell my patients, let's just start you off with a really solid breakfast. Like imagine that your breakfast is dinner. Mm -hmm. um, anxiety gets better, brain fog gets better, feeling more grounded and happy throughout the day improves. So the first thing that we'll see get better is the energy shift mm. and the mental emotional state that comes with that. And then maybe after like two to six months, the hormone concerns will get better, but it's night and day how someone is energetically feeling and mentally emotionally feeling when we start to fix the amount of food they're getting in. <laughs> yes. Yes, queen. Yeah. Yes, queen. I love when you post your breakfast yeah. and things that you're <laughs> encouraging your patients to eat because, you know, I don't consider oatmeal breakfast. No. I don't, definitely don't consider a protein bar breakfast. Mm -mm. Um, I don't consider a little croissant or a little, you know, Starbucks little muffin mm -hmm. breakfast. And even for myself, just being someone that did have a history of being raw vegan, which is again, hilarious. No offense to anyone out there, but for me, it was one of the worst things Oof. that I could have done for my mental health and my gut health. Yeah. I remember being so just malnourished on such a deep level that I never felt stable. Internally, I never felt stable. I felt like my body was always buzzing and I thought I was anxious from medical school and I wasn't. I was anxious mm -hmm. from my body being on high alert, thinking that it was starving. Yeah. And there's a lot of ways that people, you know, regardless of how you're choosing to eat in alignment with your, you know, your mindset, there's ways that you can nourish yourself. But then I also want to kind of open the window into asking people, are you eating a certain way because you think that that's how you're going to get the body that you want? Or are you eating a certain way because it's how your body is asking you to eat? Because there's a very, very, very big difference. And when I go back, and think about it, my body was asking me for denser nutrients and I just refused. Like yeah. I was like, nope, that's not something that I eat. I can't do it. And it wasn't until I was hovering above a Thanksgiving turkey that I'm um, salivating, like saliva, like pouring out of my mouth that I was like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna do this. And mm -hmm changed my life that so fat proud seeping that into my blood for you <laughs> me too i know it was just my turkey anniversary it's very exciting i love that yes yeah. yeah one of one of our colleagues asked me maybe a year ago she was like dr sarah your patients have so much success what are you doing and i was like it's nothing profound i'm just teaching them how to love themselves so that they're showing up and taking care of what i call their feminine foundation so mm -hmm. how they're eating how they're hydrating how they're moving their body how they're sleeping how they're relaxing how they're staying in relationships that serve them whether it's relationships with intimate partners or in business or with their family members and yeah so there's nothing like crazy profound that I do in my practice that I know and I'm a better doctor than anybody else. I just take us back to the basics and how can we instigate room for you to show up with self-respect, adoration for yourself and take care of yourself the way you would take care of someone you love. Because mm -hmm. someone who truly loves themselves is not going to be raw vegan, run marathons every other weekend, you know, intermittent fast, juice cleanse every Saturday. Right. For sure. I don't think so. No, no, that sounds <laughs> torturous to me. Um, you know, I will just reflect back at you that what you do is amazing and it's not easy and it's oh. easy for you because you were born to do it. Thank you. But teaching someone to love themselves and respect themselves is probably one of the most challenging things that you can do. Yeah. So I'm curious how you do that. What tools Ooh, do you use? Let's chat. So the first thing is you have to keep the promises that you make to yourself. Hmm. So if you're going to bed at night and you're saying, I'm going to drink a glass of water tomorrow, you better freaking drink that glass of water because nothing breaks self-confidence or respect more than telling yourself you're going to do something and you don't. Mm. Um, so if you are trying to make or bridge that gap between trusting yourself and not trusting yourself, starting with really small habits, like I'm not going to snooze my alarm clock tomorrow don't snooze your alarm clock tomorrow <laughs> or, and keep it small and easy. Like I will have a bite of something when I wake up. Um, so that's the first step is keeping promises to yourself that you're making and don't make grandiose, big, large promises. And once we heal that, we then work on some inner child work. <laughs> so I ask my patients, I say, do you feel more connected to the four-year-old version of yourself? 
Or do you feel more connected to your current four-year-old daughter or a future daughter if they don't have kids? And some patients say, oh, I feel more connected with my four-year-old version of myself. And some will say, I feel more connected to my daughter. And so we latch on to that, whether it's four-year-old them or their future daughter or current daughter. And whenever a negative thought comes up, I have them talk to themselves. They would talk to their younger self or to their future daughter. So let's say if they have a thought like, I don't deserve to have this cookie. Imagine four-year-old version of you coming up to you or your future daughter saying, I just don't deserve to have this. How would you talk back to them? How would you hold space for them and have compassion and give them love as opposed to just going down that guilt and shame train? Um, so yeah, inner child work is huge for helping this situation. <laughs> mm, I love that. And I love how you say, you know, you give someone the invitation to your future child too, mm -hmm. because I think that as a womb holder, sometimes it's it's hard to, when you're training yourself to love yourself for it to be on you. Yeah, totally. Mm -hmm. It's so hard. It's so hard. But we all have this internal, like maternal instinct, whether we're aware of it or not, yeah. that we want to love and nourish our offspring. Right. Or it could be a niece or a nephew. Yeah. And if, you know, if someone's having a hard time thinking of someone they love, we'll just keep bringing up ideas until something sticks and lands. Like a dog. Like a dog. <laughs> right, like we're not gonna throw our dogs on a treadmill for five hours and then not give them adequate food or water. Like, how do you treat your dog? Yeah. Treat yourself with that same love and respect. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we're not gonna give our dogs only carrots and celery and juice. No. You know, I bring this up with a lot of my plant-based patients who have animals. I say, what are you feeding them? animal protein because you love them right yeah can we do that for you i, I yeah <laughs> i love that so i'm literally giggling because when i was raw vegan did I you made try? my dogs vegan <laughs> did you no i did casey has like never been thinner like here was like gaunt my poor ex like the shit i made him oh, do gosh. yeah no okay. it, it didn't last long they weren't wow. happy so i had to learn that the you hard way been a tough patient for me <laughs> oh girl i would have been talked back i mean even the doctors that past year when i would see them they'd be like bitch you're like withering away like you need to eat more nutrients and mm -hmm. i'd be like i can get it all from plants mm -hmm. and some people can but um I don't know. I just I had a flashback to me like crop potting squash, and it was the year we had a farm, and we had like so much zucchini. And I was just like roasting zucchini for my dogs. I'm so sorry. They're yeah. doing great now. They yeah. eat a lot of meat now, but I know they do really well. Yeah, but that's a really nice exercise to have. Yeah, it really um, is. And just small steps, like doing waking up in the morning, also, and writing down three things you're going to do for yourself, mm. whether that be. Again, having a meal, calling a friend, sitting in a meditation and following through with that action and very over slowly over time, it's going to transform. You're going to reprogram your mind to talk to yourself lovingly and caringly as opposed to, oh gosh, why did you do that? You don't deserve that. You know, I know we know all the thoughts we that do. can come up. Yeah. yeah. And ultimately you're teaching yourself how to trust yourself in exactly. doing that and you're holding yourself accountable. Mm -hmm. And I think then, then people can recognize how much of their life is self-sabotaging their happiness and their health mm -hmm. ultimately, because I think that a lot of times as humans, whether we're aware of it or not, we like to be victims and we like to say that it's only because of this or that, or if I had more time or if I had a different job or, you know, if I could afford that, but it's free to wake up in the morning and for you to think about something that you're grateful for. It costs nothing for you to slow down and to look at your food with love and admiration and gratitude for what it's doing to your cells. But that's not what we're taught. So I love that those no. little baby steps are helping. Yeah. Yeah. It's not what we're taught at all. Mm -hmm. Um, food for your cells. This reminds me of something Dr. Alana Ramel said like eight years ago about how we have soul food and we, how we have cell food mm. and there's foods that are great for your soul and then mm -hmm. foods that are great for your cells. And we need both of those. We need, we need the soul food in moments of celebration to create memories, to create pleasurable experiences. And then you need your cell foods to f literally fuel your cells and mm -hmm. help you live a vital life. And the issue that comes about is if we start using soul food to mask emotions. So I'm eating ice cream every night because I'm stressed. I'm having a cinnamon roll every morning because I'm anxious about my day, or I'm drinking wine every night because I can't sleep. Then we have to do some 
work around, okay, why are we indulging in these soul foods so much? But there's a beautiful balance between the two. And I love using that analogy with my patients. I love that too. Yeah. I have so many things that are soul foods. <laughs> so many things. So many soul foods. Chicken tenders, <laughs> pie, like everything with butter and cream, pizza yeah. that destroys me because I'm lactose intolerant, but mm. soul food, baby, mm -hmm. it's important. Yeah. Truly. It's not just the restriction of food with orthorexia though. It's the, again, shifting your body into things and living in a way that's not natural. So the over-exercising, the I'm lathering myself in tanning lotion and makeup and getting my hair dyed and getting my nails done every two weeks. And it's no wonder we have autoimmune disease and hormone problems. Mm -hmm. I was thinking of this analogy when I was driving here today. Could you imagine if you took a cute little penguin and dyed its hair every month and made it run every day from 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. and told it how ugly it was and made it paint its toenails, like it would wither away. Mm -hmm. And we're doing this to humans nonstop. Nonstop. Dousing them in perfume, using all these chemical products. And it's crazy how people are wondering why we have infertility or why we're so anxious and depressed or why we all have Hashimoto's. Right. So yeah, it's not just about the food that I see results and problems from, or not results, problems from with orthorexia. It's how else are we trying to meet beauty standards that go against the grain of how we should be living. Yeah. I remember being younger and you know, I'm, I still don't know what color I am. It depends who you ask um, <laughs> and they tell you what color I am. But I just remember I had so many body image issues growing up because I don't necessarily look like everyone in my family. I'm darker. I am so hairy. I have a Jewish nose. And I just remember, you know, my best friend growing up, she was, she was like the star of the dance studio. She was blonde and blue eyes and just kind of what I thought beauty was supposed to be, what mm -hmm. I was told beauty was online, online, you know, like on TV and things <laughs> like that. I was yeah. not online then. I barely am on, online now. But I remember looking at my mom and asking her, like, who decided what's beautiful? Oh, who decided it? You like, had that thought? Yeah, then? I did. And I remember being in a room asking her this because I was, I was bullied on the bus that day because I almost said his name. Should I say his name? <laughs> Johnny I mean, Colazar. I said it. I love it. You were on my bus. Someone's going to listen to this and tell him. I know they are. Great. And he told me that I looked like a witch. Mm. And I went home that day and I cried and cried and cried and cried. And my grandma was there and she was a Scorpio and she was like, fuck him, you know, just like all <laughs> like dark. And then I just didn't understand. And my mind was trying to wrap around, like, how am I ugly? Like, what does that even mean? Mm. And it's it's so sad that as a little baby, I thought that, but I, I tore myself apart from that moment forward. I would stare at myself in the mirror and turn to the side and be like, ooh, what if I got this nose job? And some of you love commenting on my nose on this podcast. Thanks for watching and supporting. I really Really love you. Um, but I would, and oh I would, you gosh. know, pinch different parts of my body and something that can show up in any type of disordered eating or any type of body dysmorphia, really it's, you're not, it's called dysmorphia because it's not in alignment with reality. Mm -mm. And I love how you said that your mind gets so fixed on certain parts of you. And from a neurological standpoint, because I'm such a neuro nerd, it's usually an imbalance in the right side of your brain mm -hmm. because the right side of your brain is what sees the full picture. Yeah. And the left side of your brain is so detail oriented and it becomes really obsessive. Right. So if you're living in the left side of your brain, you will become hyper aware of these little things and you will pick yourself apart. But then there's also signs from a neurological standpoint that it's part of the temporal lobe and part of the parietal lobe. And the parietal lobe is how we sense different parts of ourselves. So if, and our temporal lobe is our memory. And also there's some issues in the visual centers as well. And not, you know, there's nothing wrong with you, but the way that the neural networks are connecting are a little bit confused in that the left brain is running the show and being like, no, you need to focus on this. This is wrong. Let's focus, focus, focus. Yeah. And the right side of the brain is the feminine side of the brain. It's I was going to say, the, there's yeah. that masculine feminine shift. Yeah. And it just allows you to see your whole self. And I don't know if that happened for me until maybe my 20s. And now that I think about it, it's when I started practicing yoga and shifted out of kind of my masculine mm -hmm. life. So just connecting Which dots over here. Which is hard to do as a business owner. Yeah. To not be in your masculine, it's very hard. Mm -hmm. So I applaud you. Thank you. You know, shaking <laughs> my ass, dancing helps. Yeah, that definitely Things helps. Things like that. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> Ugh, the brain, the sweet little brains of 
are developing bodies as babies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And with that obsession with dysmorphia, um, it's, it's like the general public wouldn't look at you and scrutinize you that hard. No. It's things that you become hyper-focused on. And like you were saying with the masculine, yeah. Uh, to be a woman. Yes. Yes. And I mean, I think that, you know, we're both women. We both experience life as women, but you know, I can't deny that there's a lot of men in my life that have body dysmorphia. And usually, I mean, everyone's different, but usually it was something that was programmed by the mother. Mm. And I actually have a patient who, um, came to me for all sorts of things. He actually wants to make a baby, which I love. So he's come to me for like preconception as a male, Amazing. which is truly one of my favorite things ever. Yeah. And I just love how he's showing up for his wife in this way. But we were talking about weight and how he eats and what he chooses to put in his body. And he told me that every day growing up, his mother would wake them up at seven in the morning and make them run two miles. They would come home and they would only be able to eat a limited amount of food for breakfast and lunch and dinner. And now he is almost rebelling in that way in that he's feeding his inner child, letting them eat whatever they want to eat and giving them permission to eat that. But it's it can be imprinted at a young age without even recognizing it. Like mm -hmm. a parent that is forcing you to exercise, a parent that is telling you that there's something wrong with you. And you know, I just really feel for him and for yeah. all individuals whose parents didn't make them feel lovable. Oh gosh, that's so sad. It is really sad. But yeah, it, it is happening to men too. And hopefully there's more support for them one day because mm -hmm. it's not talked about. No, in general, I just feel like men need more support to talk about things that are more taboo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I love that like men's circles and things are becoming a, a bigger part of at least the consciousness out here in Southern California. But yeah, I think the men in my life know that you can talk to me about literally anything. I'm an open book and I know you are too. <laughs> I am. Yes. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> yes. Something that I wanted to touch upon when we were talking about it earlier, which is something that I think I have spoken about on this podcast, is that when you are not nourishing yourself on such a deep level, of course, you know, fertility and menstrual cycles, mood, things like that can come up, but also sleep yeah. is such a big issue. And I love, one of my favorite things to do is when someone restricts what they eat all day, they were told that they're not supposed to eat when the sun goes down, which now is like 4.45. So what, people right. aren't eating from 4.45 until the next morning at what, like 10? That is so long. They go to sleep, they try to go to nights, and their adrenals are like, you're starving to death. <laughs> you're not gonna make it to the morning. We're gonna release a fuck ton of adrenaline. So then you get a wave of adrenaline, you get sweaty, you get shaky. So I see a lot of night sweats show up in people that are not fully nourished. And I know for myself in this little baby body that if I go to sleep the slightest bit hungry, yeah. I'm not gonna sleep through the night that night and I will wake up usually at 3 a.m. And um, so if that's me before bed, I go into the kitchen and I eat some goat cheese. I love it. Mm -hmm. Nice block of goat. Oh, go right back amazing. to bed. <laughs> yeah. So if anyone's trying to solve their mysterious insomnia, and if you are someone that also restricts how you eat, might be something to look into. Yeah. I actually started using this new protein powder that has, it's a chocolate protein powder, but it has GABA and L-theanine in it too. So I'll use it for my high school mm. patients and they drink that before they go to bed. Cause yeah. We want chocolate milk before we go to bed. Exactly. Who does not want chocolate but before that is, we go to bed? It does present as insomnia or waking up in the middle of the night feeling that adrenaline rush. Um, and then also people who restrict for so long no longer have hunger cues. Mm -hmm. So I get I hear a lot, Dr. Sarah, I'm not hungry in the morning as if it's like this badge of honor. Or if I eat something, I'm not eating because I feel nauseous. Nauseous is a hunger cue yes, for a is. lot of us gals. And it takes... If you're listening and wondering how can I start eating breakfast, I feel nauseous. It's going to take like two to three weeks for you to push past that. And then you'll eventually wake up feeling hungry mm -hmm. and like you need to eat. But if you haven't been giving yourself breakfast for many, 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 many years, it's not a uh, badge of honor. And you, you have to start viewing, fueling yourself as a gift as opposed to something that's naughty or bad or yeah. wrong. Absolutely. I try to help my patients view food as the simplest form of self-love. Mm -hmm. And I think that when that starts to shift, that can help people look at their food with more gratitude rather than almost like a task that they have to check off of their box. Yeah. Because even for me and like you, you're a busy woman. Like sometimes it's, it is an inconvenience for me to stop what I'm doing to eat, but I have to. 
But it would be a bigger inconvenience for you to be malnourished and not be able to have the brain power to support your patients. Yes. So it's like, sure, these 30 minutes are getting in the way of my chart notes and treatment plans and texting someone back, but you're not going to be able to tackle all those tasks with ease and grace if you're, yeah, if you're starving yourself and not feeling yourself correctly. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a conversation I have a ton with new moms when end their breastfeeding and oh now goodness. you're only having one meal a day. Yeah and you don't want to take 40 minutes to yourself in the morning to cook yourself three meals because you're afraid you're not giving your kids enough time and presence well they're not going to get your time and presence later when you're burnt out and depleted and snapping at them snappy yeah snappy is a blood sugar issue fam totally yeah mm -hmm. yeah yes absolutely <laughs> So I, I can already assume that I'm gonna under I'm gonna, you know, guess what you're gonna say about this, but how do you feel about intermittent fasting? I don't love it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I I think, well, I know, actually I do know this. I've done a lot of research on it. All except for one study has all been done on the male population. Mm -hmm. And the one study that has been released in the female population um, shows that it raises insulin levels. It messes with the adrenal thyroid pituitary gland access um, and causes irregular menstrual cycles. So it's not something that you want to do as someone with female dominant hormones while you're in your menstruating years. If you wanna talk about it in menopause, sure, let's hash it out. Still not a fan, but there's better mm -hmm. research supporting it in that demographic and age group. Um, but starting your day with an empty cup depleted when the hours from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. or when you're needing the most brown brain power, the most physical energy, why are you starting your day not eating? It, I, I can wrap my head around like maybe you're not eating dinner. I don't know. You just negated that because you're like, you're going to wake up in the middle of the night. Da, da, da. So I, I really can't support that either. But <laughs> if you have a typical nine to five, which a lot of people do, do not start your day not giving your brain what it needs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Anxiety city. Yeah. Yeah. Bowl of adrenaline soup. And guess what? When you first start intermittent fasting, sure, you might lose five pounds of water weight and m let your muscle waste away, but it's not sustainable. Mm -mm. It's not going to be long term like yeah physical mental emotional energy it's not, it's not sustainable yeah not a fan i'm not either i think so you knew that though i did <laughs> i just wanted the listeners to know just in case they're like but my trainer told me to or yeah. whatever yeah yeah and it works great for dudes dudes you got the same hormone output every single day from when you're like 18 to 50 ideally probably later good for them and you have this clock that sends out testosterone at the same time every day for all of those days throughout all of those years and your body can endure more stress. Again, as someone who has a womb with female hormones and your hormones are changing every single day, you you just don't wanna give yourself that damage. Mm -hmm. It's unfair. It is unfair. So you spoke earlier about carbs and the brain. Yeah. Do you find that women that you're working with restrict carbs and that that influences their menstrual cycle? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If they're restricting, if they're not having whole foods, like I'm fine if they're restricting the croissant that they were drinking with their coffee Yeah, and then yeah. replacing it with something else. But if you're showing up and just eating protein or just eating fat without that balance of the carb, um, yeah, it's going to for sure affect their menstrual cycle. Mm -hmm. And you know, the luteal phase is carb time. It it's, is. It's, 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 it's a beautiful time yeah where we're meant to eat all the carbs we are because it helps that menstrual cycle happen also carbs are needed to ovulate yeah so i find that a lot of babes that i work with if they might be bleeding every month but they're having you know those terrible pms symptoms it's probably because they're not ovulating and a lot of the times it could be because they are even if they're eating, they might be restricting carbs to the point that that's happening. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something that I see a lot. And I just want to share with my viewers, because again, I will share everything about my health with you. I don't care at all. I, my periods have never been more irregular than when I tried to intermittent fast back mm -mm. when that was like a fad. Um, I never knew when I was going to get it. Come once, one month, eight weeks later, not ideal. No. So if you want to regulate your cycles, you have to eat breakfast. Yeah. And your caloric needs in your luteal phase, which is that time after ovulation until your period starts, goes up by about 200 calories. So I hear a lot of patients being like, oh, I'm just so hungry. I have so many cravings. I'm so upset at myself for wanting to eat so much. And I'm like, listen to your body. It is such a beautiful thing. Give it what it wants. Fuel it. Give yourself some high density protein and nutrients and, and 
have an extra snack throughout the day because it needs it. You're shedding a part of your organ. Do you know how much cellular energy goes into having a menstrual cycle? Right? <laughs> so yeah. And then even just our blood is what holds our nutrients and our vitality and you lose some of that every mm -hmm. month. And I also have a lot of patients that are scared of red meat, which, mm -hmm. you know, I think that you know this. I, I eat like a steak a day. Like I love steak. Same. I love it so <laughs> much. It's my favorite animal protein. And I have no problem with telling people to eat more red meat. But uh -huh. if you are someone that menstruates and if you avoid red meat, um, that's one of the best sources of iron that you can get. So if you're bleeding once a month, and especially if you have heavy periods, which is very, very common, you are likely going to then end up being exquisitely iron deficient. And when that happens, you get anxious, you get depressed, you get exhausted, you mm -hmm. get all sorts of things happen, but you're like, doc, I eat meat. I can't be anemic. You can. Yeah. Definitely can. Definitely can, especially if a parasite's eating all your iron, which <laughs> I know you love this. We do, we do. <laughs> we love talking parasites. Yeah. Um, so yeah, no, not a fan of intermittent fasting, huge fan of boosting calories during luteal phase in addition to help support the emotional ups and downs you're going to be having. Yes. So yeah. <laughs> the emotional ups and downs of the luteal phase. Uh -huh. They're beautiful. They are. It's a superpower. It is. I have patients that are like, I get so sad before my period. How can I not do that? And I'm like, you're getting sad because you've been avoiding this emotion for how many days leading up to this part of your cycle? Mm -hmm. How about we do some PMS prevention and you lean into your sadness when you have your period, when you're ovulating before that time comes so that when the emotions are feeling or the hormones are being fluctuating really intensely, you've already processed that emotion. It's not hitting you like a ton of bricks. Mm. It's a superpower. It is a superpower. And I love you so much. And I love that you said that because I think that a lot of what women experience have been told, oh, that is a curse. Yeah. Women should be sent into the woods to bleed because they are an inconvenience to society when they are feeling and emotional. But that that darkness that we enter before we bleed is a gift for you to see everything from that moon cycle that you actually don't want, you wanna shed, you do not wanna take it with you. And if you ignore that, if you resist that, I am fully convinced that that period is gonna be way more painful, oh, way yeah. more severe. Oh, it's yeah. going to, because there's that internal resistance versus sitting with yourself, letting yourself see that, being honest with yourself and then truly letting it go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if patients are like, I'm feeling so irritable. I'm feeling so frustrated that that's a good place to check in and say, where am I lacking boundaries? If mm. you're irritated that your husband's not picking up the towel only when you're in your luteal phase, that's not true. You're irritated about that two weeks prior to you're just not speaking up about it. Yeah. Or where are you lacking boundaries in your work? And yeah, so I, we hone into figuring out how it's a superpower and how it, your hormones might be okay. And you just might have these emotional things you haven't processed mm -hmm. and having a balanced blood sugar will help you process those things better. Yes, it will. <laughs> and I just, how many women are told to silence their voice yeah. are told to hold in these kind of louder emotions. And I know for me, it's usually because of fear of abandonment or fear of being judged mm. or whatever that could be. But our throat is also so deeply connected to our mm -hmm. womb space that if we hold in these resentments or hold in these feelings, they will show up in that late luteal phase and mm -hmm. they'll need to be seen, heard. And maybe you scream it because yeah. you, it has to be heard. And that's the only way that it's going to be received versus if you did a little earlier in the cycle, it could have been, you know, maybe like a mindful conversation. Right. <laughs> Just right. a thought. I'm still learning too, fam. Yeah, okay. we are. Yeah, I'm far from perfect. Yeah. Far from it, says the girl that still has to remind herself to eat breakfast every day. Like I feel this mm -hmm. every day. I have to put conscious effort towards it. Mm -hmm. And I hear myself talk to patients sometimes and be like, girl, you gotta do that. Yeah. And I then had... I hold myself accountable. Yeah, I had a patient that was like, I aspire to be like you taking care of yourself. It just comes so easily to you. It's so natural. And I was like, uh-uh, honey. <laughs> I, yeah, it is a full job, full-time job showing up for myself. Eventually there are things that become second nature, like, oh, I take the trash out on Saturdays or now I brush my teeth every day. Like that becomes second nature after you do it as a young adult growing up the same way, eating breakfast, drinking water. I mean, I never used to drink water. I was just going to say that, Sarah. <laughs> I am so proud of you. Do you remember when the water exploded in my car? You're like, well, I don't really drink water. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking yeah, about? You guys, yeah. I used to drink like one cup of water a week. No I joke. off iced coffee and cold. I'm like, brew. how is your skin perfect? without drinking water, but now you drink water. I'm so now proud I of you. I drink water, my skin yeah. is even more perfect. Yeah. And I 
told our colleague Ashton at school one day, I was like, let me just do an experiment of trying to drink 30 ounces a day. Like that is a reach for me. And I remember so much inflammation went down. My skin looked beautiful. I had the craziest energy. I was like, this is a miracle liquid. Yes, it so is. yeah, whenever I have a patient that's like, I love water. I drink it all day long. I'm like biggest eye roll. I wish yeah. I could do that. Yes. I'm trying. So no, things don't come easily to us. Even when we have all the information in the world of how to live your life it's still an uphill climb um so yeah we work very hard we do yes <laughs> we do every day and all we day. do have a lot of empathy with some things we ask of we of you we know it's it's going to be challenging but we're here to support you mm -hmm. yeah and we know it's challenging because we have the same challenges yeah yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> for sure hmm is there anything else on your heart related to this topic that we have not dove into yet that is important for us to share about? Ooh, I don't think so. There, I mean, there probably is, but I'm just riding out the high of being able to have this conversation. Mm, I know, I yeah. know. It's, And I mean, I know that I started this with a love bomb, but truly, babe, like this would not be happening without your confidence in me, but mm. also just your confidence in all of your friends and our ability to be people that change this world. Yeah. Because I think that even, you know, bringing it back to how women and how we view ourselves, we don't always support one another. And we're, we're taught to compare ourselves to one another, to compete with one another. And that is not healthy for any part of our lives. And it's women like you that love and support the other women in their lives mm -hmm. that are helping to truly fuel the change so that we can all just show up for one another and be loving community members. Yeah. Oh. It's a good place to be. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, my babe, I think that we touched so many incredible things today that people are going to walk away with lots of little nuggets. But before we close off this conversation, I always like to give you the stage to see if you have a love bomb, a truth bomb, a knowledge bomb, anything that you want to share with my beautiful listeners that are now in love with you. Mm, good question or statement. So I would love to share that there is nothing wrong with your body and it is here to serve you. It's here to help you follow your dreams. It's here to help you experience more love, more happiness, more memories, more pleasure. And you have to show up for it and give it what it needs so that you can go out into the world and do what your soul wants to do. Let your body work for you as opposed to against you. If you need someone to be in your corner to help figure out why your body might be working against you, then Call in a naturopathic doctor. I know a few. Um, we'll help you get there. <laughs> yes. And speaking of it, since you're one of my favorite naturopathic doctors in the mm. world, how can my viewers get a hold of you if they want to work with you? Yeah. So Instagram is a great place to find me. I am the mindful doctor. Um, I also have my website, which is just drsara.com, D-R-C-E-R-A.com. I do one-on-one -on -one consultations. I also have a beautiful six-month program called Reproductive Reclamation. Um, it is a six-month education amazing resource of information about how you can reclaim your reproductive health again we walk you through how to heal your gut health how to heal your liver how to work on your skin if you have acne all things to help heal the root cause of hormone concerns and i created this course because god willing i'm here when my daughters are nice and old but god willing i'm not and they need a resource to tap into to learn about their body i want them to have this it's gonna make me cry um or like my nieces and grandchildren because there's nothing out there like this where it's a one-stop shop to figure out how they can master what i call the feminine foundation so that's a great program to dive into if you're like I have acne or I have PCOS or I have anxiety or I have migraines or I'm not getting pregnant. Where should I start? This is where you start. Yes, absolutely. Well, thank you for sharing that. Truly follow her, become obsessed <laughs> with her. I am everything that she creates is beautiful and educational and filled with that mindful, loving support. And I could almost cry at what you said just for your future babies because yeah. I truly have, I, I cannot wait for our babies to They're be best the friends. Same. They're going to be best friends. They, they are. are going to be so confident. They are going to love their bodies and they are going to continue all the work that we're doing in our lives. And yeah. I'm just so grateful that you were open to having this conversation. I am grateful for your life on a daily basis mm. and I just love you so much. So thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. You're, You're the welcome. best. <laughs> Thank you all so much for listening. I hope that you have this newfound respect for your body. And I just so appreciate all of you being here to learn along. Share this with a babe that needs to hear it, okay? Thanks.
see you soon.